the other issue that this government has been, uh, and I think quite rightly criticised for, is its attitude towards freedom of speech. And whilst it has ameliorated or modified the worst aspects of proposed changes to hate speech laws or new hate speech laws, uh, the legislation is still going through and it gives protected status, uh, very much like issues around the treaty. It gives certain groups who are identified protected status, certain people and certain groups you can't say nasty things about or you're going to be criminalised. Um, and while there has been much emphasis on the economy, on co-governance, not so much of a discussion with the new Prime Minister about where he stands on these very, very fundamental and important issues in a functioning uh, democracy. To see whether or not Chris Hipkins should have his feet held to the fire on this and to address this, we are joined now by our friend Jonathan Ayling from the Free Speech Union. Jonathan, Mary, uh, Happy New Year to you. It's a bit late, though. Um, welcome to the programme again. Lovely to have you with us. Sean, it's great to sit down with you again. All right. Now, Jonathan, um, there hasn't been, in this rather smooth transition of power, free speech and freedom of speech has not been an issue that has been raised by mainstream media or addressed, indeed, by the new Labour leader. No, and that's unfortunate. The hate speech laws that are going through uh, have been minimised to be the bare minimum of what uh, they proposed they could put forward in 2021. And now uh, we know that many, many Kiwis are very concerned by them. When we did polling, the majority of Kiwis opposed them. And so Chris Hipkins, in both a strategic and also um, through his commitment to democracy, he needs to really assess whether this is a policy he wants to keep going forward. Mm. It would be fair to say, though, the lobby, if you like, the public noise around freedom of speech is not as loud as the lobby and the public noise around Three Waters, around co-governance, around the merger of TVNZ and RNZ. It is an issue that doesn't spark or grab, despite the fact that I personally think it's very important, doesn't really grab the public's imagination like those other issues, does it? I think that's that's true at one level, though I would also say, uh, you know, the, the Free Speech Union coordinated the largest public consultation any Ministry of Justice has conducted. So uh, it, this issue has been around for longer than the merger or, or Three Waters to a certain extent. In 2021, when we uh, first started engaging this, this, this was far more prominent. And over the 12 months that followed that, we managed to push them back on five of the six proposals. So the fact yeah. that this has been around a bit longer Longer. You know, I, I, I think people feel like in many ways we've had a major victory in seeing uh, Kerry Allen at the time, uh, you know, dropping the vast majority of those proposals and the real bulk of, of the, the really concerning aspects. And now the bill that's going through Parliament does elevate uh, religious communities above broad, you know, um, inciting to contempt, which is, which is just a, a laughable standard, really. But we're pleased that uh, the government did hear from us and, and scrapped the vast majority of what I think would have been really fatal to uh, public discourse in New Zealand. I guess we could also say, Jonathan, that the philosophy that Chris Hipkins seems to be, or, or, or the broader strategy is, don't do anything that is likely to piss anyone off, uh, in, in, in brutal Kiwi terms. And I guess that might mean that for the moment, the government isn't going to go further with what we might call censorship or the restriction of freedom of speech. We, we can relax in the run-up to the election. Well, yes, but they say the, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And unfortunately, I think, I think you're probably right on the money that many Kiwis will look at this and go, oh, look, it's not a problem anymore and, and, uh, and, and move on. And, and I'm pleased that uh, the, the immediate threat of hate speech that would, that would, as I said, have been really, really catastrophic to the way we can communicate with each other, uh, that, that immediate threat has passed. And even other policy reforms like the uh, content moderation 
duration review. Uh, that is on the back burner with the uh, Department of Internal Affairs. It doesn't look like that will proceed uh, the side of the election either. And, and, and that was reshaping our censorship regime, which, which could, uh, you know, impact sites like this. Uh, that, that operate online, not just on uh, on radio frequencies. And so, yeah, we've seen that they are proceeding cautiously and, and you know, hopefully at some level, uh, the work that we've been able to do has been able to contribute to them being weary of overstepping on this mark. But I think that, that that's with regards to policy, that's with regards to politics. Uh, I think culturally, the, the issue around free speech is only getting worse and worse. And, and I think this year will actually highlight that. Our inability, not only, we don't only disagree on which direction we should take these policies in. We don't only disagree on the substance of these issues. We disagree on whether we can disagree on these issues, whether we're allowed to have a debate on some of these. Yeah, um, yeah. Really and that's funny. That is, that is so parallel with, with the issue, treaty issue thing and the race issue thing is the idea of having a debate is kind of novel, isn't it, after five years of the sort of leadership we've had. Uh, Jonathan, I, I also, and I, you know, if I, if I get a, a, a chance to interview uh, the new Prime Minister, which I hope I will do, one thing I want to ask him is, is he going to keep using groups like, you know, the Disinformation Project and Kate Hanna to advise our security forces on how to spot terrorists and stuff? Is, is that kind of, and I've been very disturbed by that, probably more than anything else, is that we seem to have a group of experts um, purveying a sense of paranoia about freedom of speech and encouraging those in authority to have an attitude that is not tolerant to dissent. And I'm wondering if That's Chris exactly Atkins, right. you know, if will Chris there, there's Atkins a fixation change that? That's emerging. On, uh, on on speech being the key issue that is that is causing all the problems in our society and 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 uh, organizations like the disinformation project or or Chris Wilson's outfit at uh, Auckland University seems to be I had him on the uh, look I'll the give him the, I'll well. give him this Jonathan at least Chris Wilson fronted up for an interview which is something Kate well, Hannah and right. the disinformation Absolutely. project and never do that, that, that's exactly right and and, and, and that indicates the the um the fear that they have of what words can mean and what words can carry what 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 sitting down with Sean Plunkett would do and and the, you know what what the contagious um, way of thinking that they might pick up there and 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 at one level you know we constantly insist they're not wrong I'm not a free speech advocate because I believe sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me I don't believe words are powerless the, the reason I believe in free speech is that they are powerful but you know the, mm. you talking about Chris Wilson there, uh, th th this commentary that has emerged uh, around the, the misogyny, misogyny and the comment. abuse and yeah. The, uh, yeah, that, 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 she, uh, that she endured, at, at one level, I don't doubt that's true. But at another level, I, I'm, I'm just shocked that people are surprised that a, 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 a prime minister that made her brand about a personality and not about a, a, a policy platform that she was going to pursue, at that point, disagreement with the prime minister is disagreement with a personality, not with, with, not with policies. And so so by its very nature, control. it becomes a gendered criticism. That, that, and and she's a woman, and so of course it is at that point. And 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 undoubtedly, I I, I don't want to undermine this. Undoubtedly, she endured it more than other women leaders as well. And I think there's a yeah. variety but we of actually uh, Chris of Wilson's re research didn't help because it hadn't been conducted over the last thirty or forty years. There was no control, and there was no real comparison to another prime minister. Well, and that's right. And, and of course, we've only seen the coverage of that research. We haven't seen the research itself yet. But from yeah. what I can see, yeah, what Chris Wilson was saying was that there were five posts a day somewhere in the dark recesses of the internet that were toxic or abusive of the Prime Minister. And and is, uh, I'm not trying to defend that. Surprise, it, surprise. Really, Knock me down with a feather. It, it, 
and, 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 and at, at some level, she's not a backbencher. She was the prime minister. And, and for better or worse, again, the Free Speech Union doesn't take a position on, on COVID response or, or on, on these other major issues. But she made some very hard calls that at one level amongst certain populations were very unpopular. And so then to blame speech as the problem is, is actually very sinister. And I, I use that word quite intentionally. I think we've looked at this and gone, a lot of this coverage is wrong, isn't it? Indicative of the work culture. But there's actually a sinister undertone that I think is very problematic in an election year that says if disagreement with this government and all that they've saved us from is actually hateful and wrong and we need to stomp it out. We're not that kind of society. Well, actually, I say first and foremost, we are the kind of society that gets to have a conversation around how our government operates, how our representatives carry themselves and work for our best interests. And if that's not the sort of country we're about anymore, we really need to consider where we've gone wrong. Yeah. And and I must say, uh, and the most notable thing, and I was sitting last night talking to people, I think I've worked under 11, or as a journalist, covered 11 different prime ministers. There is no doubt that Jacinda Ardern was the most picky, choosy, and, if you like, exclusive with the media of any of them. If you weren't one of the mates, you really didn't get a look in. She talked past the news media via Facebook and uh, Instagram and whatever else. She didn't like fronting real journalists unless she knew she was going to get an easy ride. And I asked uh, Chris Hipkins last Sunday, is that going to change? He gave the indication that he would, which I I guess in some ways, Jonathan, is an encouraging signal that we might have more debate with our Prime Minister in the next wee while. And and that that is going to be vital to any movement forward in drawing the country back from the extremes on both sides that we've swung to. And I think you and I agree that it's not, not just the woke over there that's the problem there's some real issues on on the other side of the debate that that pushes the extreme uh, further and further apart and so really it's counterintuitive but 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 talking about hateful and toxic and abusive speech is actually the sort of thing that's going to make it worse and uh and i'm pleased to hear that that the prime minister is is wanting to change that but but really sean i think it's more than just the prime minister it's more than just those in the labor party unfortunately i've recently had uh, a really disappointing encounter with with a politician on the other side of the house that you would think would be up for any debate. Okay, tell us about well, this. I, you didn't raise that unless you wanted to tell me the story, so let rip. Uh, I, 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 I won't say who the politician was, but someone on, on the right who says... No, Don't I won't, tease I, us. I Come on, Jonathan. You. Full disclosure. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I got ha- to have some secrets. But I, 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 I okay, so what happened? I think there's a cultural issue. What? Well, well, no, come uh, back. Uh, I want to know what happened. A, 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 a politician that sits down on a podcast with us and then says, oh, heck, I never realised that it was going to be this person, I, I, I said I would never talk to them. And I think, I think you know, I, I, can, I can see that there's a standard that's been set for that, but I think it's a really unfortunate tone to be set in our politics that we would look at people and say, no, I would never talk to them. And, you know, and, and, and as, as, if, as if ideas are contagious. And, and, you know, in a way that they are, but that's the point of ideas. We challenge each other. We're not going to walk away and have accidentally picked something up. Uh, no, but no one walks away and, and, and then accidentally realises is that they've shifted parties. But, but we do challenge each other, and that's really important. And so my point there is that it's unfortunate we don't see this only on one side of the house. On both sides of the house, there's growing inability to actually sit down with someone who will hold your feet to the fire, who will really disagree with you, and who will see what you're made of. And you put your cards yeah. on the table, they put their cards on the table, and you have it up. But th- that's the essence of democracy. That's how we let people decide. And so, so if Chris Hipkins is going to set a different tone here and we don't see those on the other side of the House respond, you know, there's a lot of votes to be gained, I think, in good faith going, this is what I believe, this is why I operate this way, what you got to say about it. And I think mm. that doesn't mean people will agree with him, but I think there, there's a real integrity in that that uh, will be attractive to many voters who are disenfranchised with the superficiality, a lot of the conversation that is occurring. Yeah. I guess in a broader, almost in a global sense, the other thing that Jacinda Ardern was constantly banging on about 
was the Christchurch call and trying to get uh, big tech and, and, and outfits to limit, monitor, uh, co- well, not coerce, but manage freedom of speech online. Um, Chris Hipkins hasn't mentioned that at all. And with Jacinda Ardern no longer being the Prime Minister, I'm wondering what the impact of her departure as Prime Minister will be on things like the Christchurch call. Well, uh, her, her departure as Prime Minister will have to come into play, but let's, let's see where she ends up. You know, for, for uh, Jacinda, um, I think this is an area that she has genuinely felt very committed towards, and and I know I know there's a whole lot of speculation about jobs that are lined up, et cetera, and I've no doubt that she is a sought-after woman uh, for for uh, big roles around the world. But I I would be surprised if this doesn't continue to be part of her personal agenda. Okay, and so so enough, actually the next gig I, might be working on the Christchurch call and online censorship and restriction I, of freedom I of speech, which she was that really that into. That I think it has to continue at, at, at some level. And, uh, and and at one level, I say, you know, um, the, 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 way we are con- the way we conduct ourselves in this new online green, as it were, that, 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 that humans haven't existed in in the past, is one of the most complex policy areas that face us. Our team has been working in the background on, on online speech and, 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 and how we acknowledge some of, of the harm that can be caused and yet also defend free speech and it is an exceedingly complex place. And so at one level we do need people working on that and, and more generally I think we need a better culture around how we work on free speech. I, I, okay. I, I see why anonymous accounts exist online and I think in other countries they have been important in enabling free speech and enabling political discussion but in New Zealand I would say if you don't, if you don't own who you are, no, no police are going to come knocking on your door at this stage. Uh, the, the, the cultural censors are the one more out there. Actually own who you are. And of course, you know, on, on, on our Facebook page, we, we have a fairly strong line media, uh, social media presence, and we have trolls constantly and, and, and just who, who would never own who they are. And, and I say free speech doesn't necessarily guarantee you the right to anonymity. Uh, so, mm. so I think we need to look at some of these questions. And, and if, if Justin Jardin wants to contribute to that, brilliant. But what we have to do, Sean, is come back to a belief that has grounded the, the West for, what, 600 years now almost, that says allowing everyone to have their say is complicated and it can be problematic, but it really is the best way forward. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and we've kind of come to this point where whenever free speech is mentioned, we talk about hate speech first, we talk about uh, racism or transphobia, and then we go, but I guess it's important that we respect people's free speech. And I said, we really need to flip that. The, the reason racism is an issue to discuss that, that we want to address and, and continue to move forward through is because speech has moved our country to a place where we don't think it's acceptable anymore. And, and the reason yeah. we, we consider you know, uh, gay people to be part of our community is because they made their case through free speech. So we need to stop kind of uh, hiding it away like it's the ugly cousin. It really is the, the cornerstone on which liberal democracy is built. All right. In a general sense, then, does the departure of Jacinda Ardern, is that good for free speech and freedom of speech in New Zealand, in your opinion? I I don't really know if... um, Oh, come on, Jonathan. Don't sit on the fence. Uh, I I think it has a huge... Personally, I'm going to tell you, I think it has a huge impact. I, I would say that there are the, the, the structural influences are still in place, and by that, I, I, again, Sean, you and I have had this conversation. I, I think the cultural aspect, the cultural defence of free speech, is a far more important place than than the legal uh, defence. Uh, and so I just don't the, the think Chris Hipkins is the same sort of uh, same sort of woke pill clutcher that that, that Jacinda Ardern was. No, I agree. Uh, but I don't you think know, he's going to uh, make it such a big deal. We haven't seen Chris. 
We haven't seen Chris Hipkins' cabinet line up yet, but uh, I don't I don't think we were actually going to see any more law changes go through Parliament mm. in the next term had Jacinda Ardern been re-elected as Prime Minister yeah. anyway. So it's not a question yeah. of, 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 of the Parliament. Uh, you know, Jan Tanetti's influence on the content um, regulation review, wh- wh- how, how, how is that going to be continued? You know, th- that, that's a real question. The influence of, of people like the Disinformation Project. Uh, th- these are the questions yeah. that I think are more structural. I mean, the appointment of a chief executive Executive at the Human Rights Commission, uh, Meg Durand is is taking the role there, and and I used to uh, I was an intern with uh, the, when she was there at Amnesty International uh, in in 2016. So I, I I I don't know her well, but I know her a little bit. I'm really interested to see what her influence will be there. As this, she's the first chief, chief executive to ever be named at the Human Rights Commission. How is that going to impact uh, uh, Paul Hunt and and the the completely inept work he's done at defending mm. free speech hopefully she goes in there and really picks it up that's the structural influence that i think is going to have a far bigger impact on free speech than the prime minister i know i know for for a certain community jacinda represented all that was wrong and and i think that is as simplistic and farcical as the other side who who claim that speech represents all that is wrong I, oh, I think come on aren't you a misogynist guy you problem. hated her like the rest of us we hated her because she was a woman didn't we jonathan that's the narrative. Well, I there, there would be some that would tell me that, but I'm not an incel, Sean. So, you know, maybe I get an outcome <laughs> because of that. You're not sitting in a dark room in an ill-fitting Superman outfit, um, Jonathan. Hey, that's, thank that's, you so much for your yeah, time. I, 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 and I think it's really interesting that we, that we haven't talked about this issue in the context. The media are looking somewhere else, but it's still a really important issue. And it's, oh, I know we always get a great reaction when we have you on. That's Jonathan Ayling um, from the Free Speech Union. Um, and I've got some feedback on this, and I want you to have feel free to comment on it. Um, oh, apparently Simon O'Connor gave a powerful speech on free speech in Parliament last month. Thank you, Joy. Is, are you related to him? Um... Sean, after the mosque shooting, Research New Zealand asked people what they thought New Zealand felt about diversity. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Califer Taylor said, I think New Zealanders are divided. You have half saying they're in favour of uh, or unsure and half saying they aren't. One in three of those born in Australia think that the high rates of immigration are the worst thing that's ever happened in their country. I'm just trying to get the context for you sending me that text, to be honest. Like this one. From Chris, I'm an anti-vaxxer. Why would I vote for this Prime Minister? I don't know, Chris. Ring up and tell me why that would be an issue for you. Um, Geez, that was interesting, that chat with Jonathan Aileen. And I've got to say, some insights I have is that Chris Hipkins is a supporter of free speech and was concerned at where we were going on that issue. And I can't tell you how I know that, but I do know that to be the case.